Hi, girls. Um, my name is Sally, and uh, we're going to be looking at the life and ministry of Jesus. Before I forget, begin, I just want to thank Ampufa for that beautiful song of worship and um, that beautiful prayer. I'm going to pray real quick um, before I begin. Father God, I come before you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you, Father God, for this privilege and the opportunity, Lord, to study your word, Deborah. Thank you for the time we spend together in this, Father God. Lord, calm my nerves, Father God. Hide me behind your cross, Lord Jesus. Lord, anything that I have prepared, Lord, let it not come from me, Jesus, but only from you, Father God. Use me as your vessel, Lord. Speak to your daughters right now, Father God, as we learn about your word. In Jesus' holy, mighty name, amen. So, um, so tonight, girls, we're going to be uh, talking about the life and ministry of Jesus. And we began this um, we began this study, and we started with the birth and resurre- uh, reincarnation, the birth and reincarnation of Jesus. We talked about boy Jesus, the baptism of Jesus, the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus calling his disciples, him clearing the temple. And Delilah um, shared a two-part study on the Sermon of the Mount. And as Jesus talked to his disciples there, he was also talking to a large crowd that, crowd that gathered. So he wasn't just speaking um, to his disciples. It wasn't just a private conversation, but he was speaking to many, many people when he was on the Sermon on the Mount and um, when he shared on the Beatitude and who the kingdom belonged to. And um, we're going to be following the Beatitudes with the salt and light. And tonight we're picking back up this um, ministry of Jesus, and I'll be sharing on Matthew 5, 15, through 16. Um, and I'll be sharing a lot of scriptures, girls. So if you want to grab a pen, a paper, pull out your Bible, take some notes, if you can, because um, I will be sharing a lot of scriptures. And I know that there's still so much on this topic that can be added. So I can't wait, honestly, for the questions and comments to even hear what you girls can add to this. Um, so I'm going to begin reading. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and it says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can it be made salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Amen. So I broke down this study um, in a few different parts. So we hear Jesus stating some facts. He asks us a rhetorical question, he shares some common sense, and then he gives us a command, right? So let's start with the facts. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. And I did some research on salt, and why is Jesus calling us the salt? When Jesus talks to his disciples, he's talking to us as Christians. We are his disciples as his believers. And I learned some really interesting things about salt, what it is, what it's used for, and this will give us a better understanding to why we are the salt of the earth. Why did Jesus call us the salt of the earth? What are the benefits and usage for salt? So I made a list of five different things, and we're going to start with number one. So the first thing I think of with salt is seasoning and taste. Salt is used as a flavor enhancer to seasoned food. Just as people today, in the ancient times, people added salt to season their food. Salt will transform and not conform. And you see that in cooking. Think about it. If you put salt on a potato, the potato will taste like salt. The salt will never taste like a potato, right? 
The second thing we have is for a cleanser and cleaning agent. And they would do, they would clean wounds with salt. Um, it was used as like a disinfectant. Ezekiel 16 talks about washing babies in salt after they were born. And then in Second Kings, it says, Then they went out to the spring and supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it. Then he said, This is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. Okay. So number three is sacrifices and covenants. So salt in the Old Testament is used as burnt offerings, is used in burnt offerings and sacrifices. In Leviticus uh, 2.13 it says, you shall season all of your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offerings. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Amen? So, um, the website got questions said that in ancient, in like ancient world, ingesting salt was a way to make an agreement legally binding. So if two parties entered into an agreement, they would eat salt together in the presence of a witness and that act would bind their contract. It was also used as a sign of peace. Um, if two people were against each other and they ate salt together, they would now be under one another's protection. A covenant of salt was to be everlasting and not to ever be broken. And Numbers eight eighteen nineteen says, I give to you and your sons and daughters all the holy contributions that the Israelites present to the Lord as a permanent statue. It is a permanent covenant of salt before the Lord for you shall, for you as well as your offspring. And in Second Chronicles 13.5 mentions just a salt uh just that kind of salt covenant. It says, don't you know the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of, is- of Israel to David and his, de- his descendants forever by the covenant of salt? And as we know, this covenant was kept through David's de- descendants. And through David's descendants came the king of kings, Jesus. Right? So um, number four is currency. Salt was used as payment because of how valuable it was. Roman soldiers were often um, were often paid in salt as well. And the number five is a preservative. One of the main usages for salt was to preserve meat and their food from decaying and rotting. Unfortunately, they did not have refrigerators to keep their food fresh. So salt was very important during this time. It was an essential for them. Jesus uses this reference of salt to his disciples as something they are familiar with, and we see how valuable and important salt is. So what does that mean for us today? Why are we called this, and how do we demonstrate our saltiness as believers um, as believers, and as Christians? Jesus is telling us that we are useful and we are valuable. We are to help preserve, help be the preservative of the world. We, as believers, can help slow down the process of sinful decaying of people by sharing the gospel and the good news and by shining a good light. The Bible tells us, as believers, how we should be, act, live, and this is one of those things that Jesus is telling us, that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. This is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. Now, I'm not a big fan of the message translation, but um, when I looked up verse 13, it said it pretty interesting, so I'm going to read it. It says, let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Amen? 
So Paul says, um, he says, at this, at the same time, pray also for us and that God may open doors to us for the message to speak the mysteries of the Messiah for which I am in prison. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of your time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. And that's in uh, Colossians 4. Uh, 4 verses uh, 3 through 5. And then in Mark 9, um, 50, it says, Salt is good. But what if salt has lost its saltiness? How will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. Amen. So as the salt, we are held to a higher standard. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are to pick up our cross and follow him daily, imitating Jesus. Our speech should be gracious without slander, without gossip lifting up one another as the body of Christ working together. The Bible tells us to pursue peace with one another. And this is definitely something I myself, I struggle with daily, and I really pray I can do better with this because I really, I fail at this constantly. Um, but it's something we need to remind ourselves is that we are the church, and as the church, there should be trust and peace uplifting each other in Scripture, in prayer, in the dictionary, if you type in salt of the earth, it says an individual or group considered as representative of the best or noblest element of society. We are the children of God. We are the only good this world has. By sharing the gospel, Christians who obey God and do his will will serve as preservatives of the human race by slowing down the process of moral and sinful decay of the world around them. We are the salt of the earth. So the same way we have the fruit of the spirit, demonstrating the fruit of the spirit in us is being the salt of the earth, being the saltiness of the earth. And that's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That's the standard we are held to. The scripture also mentions a question, right? It says, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can it be made salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. So this is, this is a rhetorical question Jesus is asking. And we, and because he knows the answer to this question, you know, he's, he's not asking it because he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer to it. And I personally struggled with this question, and I believe it means it's referring to a false convert, people who act like salt but are not truly salt, because salt cannot lose its saltiness. Otherwise, it wouldn't be salt. Therefore, it's useless. Then the scripture says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it, puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Amen. So here... Jesus is calling us the light of the world. Then he shares some of that common sense. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. And what I got from that is that, again, that's useless to light a lamp and then hide it. The purpose of a light is for to shine and not be hidden. As believers, we should be shining our light for the world to see. Otherwise, we're useless. When you are born again, you become a light. And now because you are the light of the world, you become a church, a city set on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. 
But the truth is, we are born into sin and darkness, and it is only through Jesus that we have been given light and been taken out of darkness. And we see that in Ephesians 5, um, 16 through 14. And it says, Let no one deceive you with an empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners, for you were once in darkness, but now you are in light of the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by light is made visible. For, for what makes everything visible is light. Therefore, it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Amen. So we're going to go back to that scripture in a minute, but I'm going to be reading from the book of John because here. We hear a lot about Jesus being the light of the world. And I'm going to start in John 3, verses 14 through 21. And it is a lot of reading, so just bear with me, go. And it says, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God the one and only Son. The judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than the light, and their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for the fear of their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing of what God wants. John, amen. Amen. John um, 11, 9 through 10 says, Jesus answered, um, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Jesus also says in John eight twelve. again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. So we read God sent his one and only son, Jesus, the true light into this dark world to give us light for eternal life. Amen. So John, John 1, 6 through 14 says, God sent a man, um, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and they even rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not of a physical birth resulting in human passion or plan, but the birth that comes from God. So the world became, the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. 
And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father, the one and only Son. Amen. Amen. So the Ephesian scripture I wanted to go back to real quick was because it was quoting Isaiah 60. Um, and it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. The thick darkness, uh, the, the thick darkness, the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Amen. So this was giving us a nice little wake-up call, rise and shine. And we rise and shine for God's glory, not our own. We shine his light for all to see. The purpose of our light is to draw people to the Lord and glorifying him. This world has two natural lights, the sun and the moon. One is self-sufficient and the other one is sustained by the other. Jesus is the sunlight. And we are the moonlight. The moon has no light of its own, but it's only through the sunlight it can shine. It has, um, it's only, it's the only light it has is because the sun gives it. It does not do it on its own. In the same way, there is no light in us unless Jesus' light shines in us. It is only by him, through him, and for him. For him be the glory. This is why we have been given this light, to draw people to him and his kingdom for his glory. Amen? So now let's look at this command. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Amen. So we see here, Jesus is saying, let your good deeds shine. But when you go into the next chapter in Matthew 6, it says, beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So one chapter says, let your good deeds shine. And the other one says, don't show your good deeds. But really, in fact, these are saying two very completely different things. And I watched a a sermon, and I think it was Matt Chandler. Um, It's In Matthew 5, it's talking about letting your good light shine out for all to see for that God gets the glory. In Matthew 6, it warns us not to show good deeds for us to receive praise for for our own glory. And in the sermon I watched, he explained it like this. So if we're hungry, we're starving, we're freezing, we're deprived, we're living in darkness, and I go and I'm Sally and I need Jesus, and I was given food, warm clothes, a lamp, all these things, right? And now I take it back to you guys and I give it to you and say, look what I got for everyone. Look what I'm giving you. Um, I'm basically boasting about what I'm doing, um, and it's I'm doing this in order to be seen by everyone, and everyone would end up thanking me and praising me because now I'm giving these things. But if I come to you and I say I met Jesus, and he gave and and he has what you need. Come, follow me, and I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to take you to Jesus. And now Jesus gives you everything he needs, everything you need. Now he gets the glory. So the really, the difference is the motive of your heart. Are you shining a light to be seen for our benefit or are we shining a light for all to see God's glory? So it's like I said, it's really the motives of the heart. If I'm taking you by your hand and, and I'm bringing you to Jesus, I'm shining his light. Um, so just to summarize a little bit before we close, Jesus is preaching to his disciples and he's revealing to them that he has a purpose for them. He is telling them that they have value and as his followers to bring, to bring God, to bring people to him by sharing his good news, 
to bring salvation for his glory. As Christians, we are to be set apart for this purpose. We are not to be conformed, but transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is not something we can do on our own, in our own dark and sinful nature. It is only, the only good in us is given by Jesus, who light is shining within us in this dark world. We should be recognized as ambassadors of Christ. Our light should be shining among the lost, the unsaved, so that they can find they can find life in Jesus by sharing about the work of Jesus on the cross. It is the only hope people have through the power of the Holy Spirit to save a soul from everlasting corru- corruption. Our example alone as salt can't change the sinner, but the light over darkness can, and that's the light. That light comes from God. The message of the gospel is the light that saves people. So how do we shine his light and how do we be the salt? By reading his word, by worshiping God, staying in fellowship, staying in prayer. Um, And the Lord will pour into us and his spirit, spirit will empty out ourselves and our flesh. And as we go through our own sanctification, It is then we can have speech that is seasoned with salt and we can pursue peace and forgive and not hold on to anger and bitterness because of the fruit of the Spirit working in us. And then we can submit to his perfect will for his glory. And um, um, before I uh, before I close, I'm going to just reread the scripture and then I'm going to pray. Okay. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall it be made salty again? How should that saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under uh, under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hilltop cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine out before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen.